It's a great uh, pleasure and privilege for me to be here with you and to uh, be able to participate in this conference and to joy, enjoy the glories of the music here and to look into the word with you and these other uh, distinguished speakers. And it is a great uh, joy and privilege to be part of uh, Ligonier's ministry and to um, have fellowship with uh, R.C. at Vesta to appreciate a new, what uh, wonderful contributions they've made to the cause of Christ and to the defense of the gospel. And uh, since I always say such nice things about R.C., I don't know why I got such lousy titles. <laughs> have you noticed this, you know, the attack on the Bible, this means war, a good thing gone bad. Now there's titles you could do something with. And what do I get? Five errors. Yeah, you know, I, I used to have a professor of, of uh, history who said, uh, history is so interesting that you have to work really hard to make it dull. And most historians are very hardworking. <laughs> well, the, my title sort of is five errors, you know. Why five? The only, you know, I really pondered that for a long time. It shows that I have far too much time on my hands. But I, I, I pondered that, and I wondered, five errors. And all I could think of is that obviously there is a measure of obsession at Ligonier Ministries about five points. <laughs> They can't seem to get beyond that. And, and this made me extremely nervous. What if I only could think of four errors? <laughs> I'd be revealed as a sub-Calvinist. <laughs> or, or suppose I came up with six errors. I'd be a hyper-Calvinist. <laughs> Well, I hope you'll all be relieved to discover I found five errors. <laughs> I'm a Calvinist, and these errors will even perhaps have a slightly familiar ring to them. But let me begin by reading just a few verses from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32 at verse 45. Deuteronomy 32 at verse 45. When Moses finished reciting all these words to all Israel, he said to them, take to heart all the words I have solemnly declared to you this day so that you may command your children to obey carefully all the words of this law. They are not just idle words for you. They are your life. They are your life. This is why we're concerned about the Word of God. This is why we must be combatants in the war on the Word, because the Word is not just idle words. The Word is not just a curiosity that we've been handed. Uh, the Word is not just something that should occupy our idle moments, but the Scriptures themselves bear testimony that the Word is our life. The Word is God's revelation of His saving work and purpose and if we don't have that word, we don't have life. And so it's important to think about what are the attacks on the word? What are some of the specific errors about the word into which we can fall? And before we look at that directly, I have to uh, say just a word in the spirit of Paul Sailhammer to a couple here from my congregation in uh, Escondido, California. The Den Boers today is Debbie Den Boers' birthday, and I want to wish her a happy birthday. I don't know where she is, but um, Dutch people love to have the spotlight put on them, so I know Debbie is mad at me right now, but um, happy birthday, Debbie. Okay, five errors. The first error I would point out to you is total slothfulness. Some of you already see a pattern developing. <laughs> total slothfulness. Now, sloth, you may be aware, is one of the seven deadly sins in the medieval catalog of sins and happens to be one of my own personal favorites. I, I like just the sound of the word. Sloth. One of the things I appreciate about Ligonier Conference is it's always stimulating to the vocabulary, so I wanted to make my own contribution. <laughs> sloth. There's a great word. It just means laziness, but it's a great way of saying lazy. 
It always reminds me of that line in Shakespeare, I did waste time, now doth time waste me. Kind of sobering thought, especially when you reach my advanced age. Total slothfulness, what does that mean when we apply it to the scripture? It means that we're lazy about the word. Uh, almost every family in America probably has a Bible in the home. And how often is that Bible opened? We're too often lazy about the word. We don't open it, we don't look into it. And even those of us who do open it, and we don't want to just look at those uh, errors about the word that other people fall into, that might be comforting, but we want to spend a little time thinking about the errors about the word that we're inclined to fall into. Uh, preachers get to be much more popular if they attack other people's sins. They get into more trouble if they attack our sins. But we need to think about what are the errors to which we're inclined? Well, we're probably not inclined, the, the group that would gather here, not inclined to not open our Bibles. We're not that kind of slothful in our approach to Scripture. But are we content too often to read Scripture in the way that is often classified as devotionally? Now, I'm not attacking the devotional reading of Scripture, but I find some people use that devotional idea of reading Scripture as if that means we don't really think about what we're reading. We just try to feel about what we're reading. What does this verse mean to you? How does this verse inspire you right off the surface of it to some idea or some action? And I think that can easily slip into a kind of slothfulness where we don't think carefully about what the word is saying and teaching and meaning. We don't try to plumb the depths of the word. We don't try to study it and reflect upon it and enter into it. But we're satisfied with a kind of once over lightly from which we derive a certain feeling about the word. The Bible calls upon us to study the Word. The Bible calls upon us to meditate upon the Word. And at least in Hebrew, it appears that that word meditation really means to mutter the Word, to have it so in mind that we can repeat it over and over again. We can reflect upon it. Uh, we can look at it from a variety of angles so that we enter into it. We come to understand it. We grow in it. And it's a good test for us to ask ourselves, how, how do we approach the Bible? What kind of time do we spend with it? It's not how much of the Bible you read or how much time you spend reading the Bible. That's the really critical issue. The really critical issue is, are you engaging when the, with the Bible when you read it? Are you really pausing to reflect on what it's saying to you, what it means for you, what it is testifying to you about Jesus Christ. Now, both in this message and the next one, I want to draw some examples about the points I'm making, particularly from the early chapters of Mark, uh, Matthew's Gospel. And so if you want to uh, turn there, we'll be looking at uh, a few passages there as we go along. And uh, right at the beginning of Matthew's Gospel is a good test, I suppose, of our slothfulness. How does Matthew's gospel begins? How does it begin? Well, it begins with a, a section that we skip. <laughs> We're not quite sure why those Hebrews so delighted in making long lists of names, but we know what we do when we come to them. We skip them. And, um, my, uh, my uh, desire here is not to encourage us to have a dramatic reading of the genealogy later, later in the session, but to at least pause and say, why, when these names are all so boring to us, did it ever occur to Matthew to include them? And of course, Matthew really tells us, doesn't he, both at the beginning and at the end of the genealogy. He must have foreseen our day and knew we wouldn't really pay attention. And so he tells us at the beginning and the end of the genealogy why it's important. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. 
And then at the end, verse 17 of chapter 1, thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to Christ. Here, Matthew is laying out the great moments of the history of the people of God. Abraham, the father of the faithful. Jesus is his son. Abraham, the one to whom God spoke his promise and said, in your seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That promise is fulfilled in the coming of the Christ. David, the man after God's own heart. David, the king of God's people. David, whose kingship foreshadowed the kingship of Christ. He is the father of our Lord. Jesus is descended from David. Jesus is great David's greater son. But David's kingship for all the promises, for all the blessings that surrounded it, failed. And the people went into exile. And in their exile, they waited. They waited for the fulfillment of the promise. They waited for the coming of Messiah. And Matthew is saying, the father of the faithful, to whom the promise that all the nations of the earth would be blessed, and David, the king who pointed to the coming of the greater king, and the exile that showed the failure of the old kingship, all that is signified in that is now fulfilled in the coming of Jesus Christ. History has a movement. History has a purpose. And Jesus stands at the center of it. Wouldn't it be a shame to miss that point that Matthew is making because we're a little too lazy to pause over this portion of Scripture and think about it? We all know, don't we, the, the dividends of digging into the Scripture. We've all been and heard messages where we come away saying, wow, I never knew that Scripture meant that. Of course, half the time it's because the Scripture really didn't mean that, but that's a, that's a whole other issue. I don't want to get into that. But, but look with me just for a minute at um, the, the important point being made in chapter 2 with the visit of the, of the Magi to Jesus, where the Magi say to Herod, where is the one who is been born king of the Jews, we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Verse 2 of chapter 2. We've come to worship him. And then in verse 8 and verse 11, that theme of worshiping him is repeated. We're perhaps so familiar with that story, we don't even pause to think very much about it. But that's a very important testimony to the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, especially when we move on to Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 4. And what do we find there? There in the temptation in the wilderness where Jesus confronts the evil one, the evil one calls on Jesus to bow down and worship him. And what does Jesus say? Using exactly the same Greek word, he says, you shall worship only the Lord your God. Matthew is saying that Jesus as a baby received that worship. And Jesus as a man declares that only God is worthy of that worship. And what does that tell us? It tells us that Jesus is God come in the flesh. That's the benefit, you see, of meditating on the Word, of spending time with the Word, of thinking about the Word. Now, this is not a call for all of us to become ministers or professors. I happen to think ministers and professors are useful creatures, slightly embarrassing, but need to be called out from time to time. We can't all study the Greek language. We can't all spend a great deal of time uh, in in-depth study of the Word of God, but we can all seek to find ministers who will lead us in this way into the Word of God. We had a pastor who retired a couple of years ago, and one of the things he said, said at his retirement was, thank you, congregation, for paying me to study the Word of God. And we do that because we want someone to give his time to that intense study. If the Word of God is our life, then we want somebody who can help us live, who can know that Word, have time with that Word. And what a privilege it is then if we are led into that Word in a profound and deep and reliable way. And you see where that particularly impacts you is with the question, what kind of preacher do I seek out? 
What kind of teacher do I like to hear? What kind of books about the Christian faith do I like to read? Do I like to read stuff that's just frothy and entertaining and easy, or do I like stuff that challenges me to grow and develop and maybe even rethink something? Now, there's something we Americans are opposed to in principle, thinking in the first place or rethinking in the second place. But you see, we need to avoid a total slothfulness as one of the great errors in approaching the Bible. Secondly, the second error to which we are prone is unconditional self-confidence. <laughs> unconditional self-confidence. This is pride, another deadly sin. And uh, when we think of this kind of self-confidence in relation to the word, uh, we may very well um, uh, think primarily of liberalism, and that's always a good place to begin. What is the essential attitude of liberalism towards the word? The essential attitude of liberalism towards the word is, I stand in judgment of the word, it does not stand in judgment of me. I decide what's true and not true in the Word. I decide what I'll follow and what I won't follow. I'll decide what's reliable and what's not reliable. And there's an amazing kind of self-confidence there. There's a, a staggering kind of pride there. In the heyday of liberalism back in the 1920s, one of the great issues debated was the doctrine of the virgin birth. And liberals said, well, modern people can't believe some kind of legend like that. Modern people know how conception works. It's amazing the ancients were able to have children at all. <laughs> we can't believe something like the virgin birth. It can't be true. Things like that don't happen. And the Bible only says it twice. And so let's just kind of spiritualize this text. I, I heard one liberal say once, uh, you know what this text is really teaching us? Jesus was born a virgin Israel. How often did the prophets refer to Israel as a virgin? <laughs> and how often were certain other images used of Israel's faithfulness? But you see, the, the, the basic point is that this is, this is an attitude of superiority, of pride, of standing in judgment over the Word of God. And if we stand in judgment over the Word of God, it will never fulfill its function in us of judging us. But it's not just liberals who can be filled with pride as they approach the Scripture. It can be us, too. Uh, Ken was just pointing out so effectively the, the danger of a kind of radical individualism that comes to the Scripture and says, I can figure this all out on my own. I don't need anybody else. I don't need any help. I don't need any uh, other people to think about this. Uh, Table Talk a, a while back did a series um, on uh, approaches to Scripture. And one of the provisional titles, I don't know if you finally used the title or not, one of the provisional titles that I really liked was Solo Scriptura. Not sola scriptura, the scripture alone, but solo scriptura, me as a solo act with the Bible. I'll do it all on my own. Uh, this is profoundly unbiblical and profoundly unreformed. We need the humility that says, I don't know it all. Uh, it's often forgotten that when Luther appeared before the emperor at the Diet of Worms and was asked if he would recant of his errors, the first thing he said was not, here I stand. The first thing he said was, can I have 24 hours to think it over? And Luther recorded that he wrestled for 24 hours with the question, am I alone wise? And I've often said most American evangelicals never wrestle with that question. Am I alone wise? Of course. What could be more likely than that? I know myself to be a splendid person. I like myself a lot. And I always believe what I think. And therefore, I must be right. Uh, 
Uh, recently, uh, uh, we've seen a very sad manifestation of that um, in a, uh, the work of a man who did a lot to spread Reformed Christianity in this country, Harold Camping. How many people have heard of Harold Camping? He was my Bible teacher in high school. Laugh? Everything? I, no. Um, uh, he did a lot of good. And now suddenly, having spent years alone with his Bible and not listening to the broader Christian community, he's come to the very sad conclusion that all churches have now failed and that all Christians should leave all churches. This is solo scriptura at work. A man who really isolated himself from real contact with others in the formation of his thought and has come, in my judgment, to a very, very bad conclusion. But you know, it's not just an individualism that can do that. A theological tradition can do that. We can only talk to each other. We can never pause to rethink and re-examine. We can become so proud that we are obnoxious. A lot of people feel that about the Reformed community. Our religion's all in our head, and we're awfully proud about it. Now, I don't think most of the time that's a fair criticism. That's a criticism we ought to listen to. It's a criticism we ought to think about. It's certainly an impression that we ought to seek to overcome. Because the theological virtue that is the opposite of the sin of pride is the virtue of humility. And we ought to be a humble people. We are certainly a people that has a lot to be humble about. We are not wise, and we're not rich, and we're not very successful by and large. And we ought to be humble, and we ought to be humble above all else before the Word. And Jesus, I think, in his confrontation with the devil, particularly it's, as it's recorded in Matthew chapter 4, provides us with a wonderful pathway to follow to avoid unconditional self-confidence. The devil, as we know in one of the temptations of Jesus, quotes the Bible. Cast yourself down from the temple because he has promised that it, his angels will take charge of thee lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. The devil came with the word. And how does Jesus respond to this misuse and abuse of the word? He could have responded in all sorts of ways. He could have said, look, buddy, I was baptized with the Holy Spirit, and I know what the word means. Or he could have said, I wrote this word. Don't tell me what it means. Or he could have said, I know the tra tradition of the rabbis, and so I know what it means. There are all sorts of authorities that he could have appealed to quite legitimately to answer the devil. How does he answer the devil? If we look at verse 7 of Matthew chapter 4. Jesus answered him, it is also written. Jesus signals there, first of all, his submission to the word as his authority. It's fascinating, these opening chapters of Matthew. Matthew says over and over again, this was done that the scripture might be fulfilled. This was done that the prophecy might be fulfilled. This was done that the scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus came to fulfill the scriptures as God's word and God's will. And Jesus says to the devil, if there's a question about the meaning of the Bible, the only place to look is back to the Bible, is to go again to the Bible. And Jesus teaches us there where we have a disagreement, where we have a problem, where we have a difficulty. The only thing to do is to go back to the Bible. When I try to convince Ken Jones about the manifold errors that he holds on the sacrament of baptism, <laughs> I can quote the Westminster Confession of Faith, I can quote the Heidelberg Catechism. I can even quote our real authority, John Calvin. <laughs> and in the end of the day, Ken just shakes his head and scoffs, which he should. But together, we can go back to the Bible and say, what does the Bible really say about baptism? 
And the only way we're ever going to get anywhere over that impasse between Baptists and pedo-Baptists is to keep going back to the Scripture. Now, because we're sinners, we may never solve the problem, but there's not even any hope of solving the problem unless we keep going back to the Scripture together. There's not much hope because Ken is on this point apparently invincibly ignorant. <laughs> and I'm nicely manifesting that reformed pride and arrogance that uh, uh, I have been attacking. Okay, total slothfulness, unconditional self-confidence, limited connections. I didn't say this was going to be good, I'm just, you know, I'm hoping maybe it'll be memorable. Um, limited connections, what do I mean by that? I think one of the temptations that perhaps evangelicals in particularly uh, may be drawn to is the temptation to treat the Bible as a fairly disconnected series of stories. Uh, evangelicals often have a great deal of Bible knowledge that's very impressive. They know the content, they know the stories of the Bible. But there is a danger that in knowing those stories, we will miss connections. We will miss the system of truth that the Scripture reveals to us. We live in a world where very often system is seen as a very bad word, and I want us to get over that. System is a good thing. Uh, God is internally consistent with Himself, and His Word is internally consistent with itself. It reflects Him. And God is not full of internal contradictions, and neither is His Word. But rather, there's a pattern. There's a, a, a picture of progressive revelation in the Scripture. Look again with me just at these early chapters of Matthew to look at this point. Very familiar stories here. Uh, we have the genealogy. We have uh, the visit of the Magi. We have Herod's slaughter of the children. We have the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. We have the early preaching of Jesus. All in these first four chapters of Matthew's Gospel. Those stories are all probably very, very familiar to us. But do we, with equal clarity, see that Matthew is telling all of these stories to make one great systematic point. And the great systematic point that Matthew is making is that Jesus is the King of the Jews and our King. Why the genealogy? To prove that Jesus is born a King, the Son of David. Why the visit of the Magi? to show that Jesus was honored as king, even as an infant. Why the slaughter of the children by Herod? Because we see there the persecution of the king, as Herod, knowing that Jesus is the true king, seeks to destroy him. Why the temptation in the wilderness? Because the devil tries to make Jesus become king as a false king. Bow down and worship me, and I'll give you the kingdoms of the world, the devil says. He could have been an easy false king. That was the temptation. And what does Jesus preach as he begins to preach? He begins to preach as John had, that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom has come near to you. If the kingdom has come near, so too has the king. And that's why Jesus taught as one with authority. He was the king. Later in the Gospel, Matthew makes the point that Jesus enters Jerusalem triumphantly as the one hailed as king by the people. When he was crucified, Matthew tells us he died under a sign that said, this is the king of the Jews. And when Jesus was raised in glory from the dead, he gave a commission to his disciples saying, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. He declared himself to be king. And so it's not surprising that when John, in the book of the Revelation, begins that book, he blesses the church in the name of Jesus, who is the ruler of the kings of the earth. Who is Jesus? He's not the one who, the one who will one day be king. He's the one who is king of his people today. 
He will not one day be king of kings and lord of lords. He is today king of kings and lord of lords. He is not uh, a king of two peoples, the Jews and the church. The message of the New Testament is that he's the king of one people, the Gentiles engrafted into his kingship as king of the Jews. That's what Matthew's saying. There's a systematic presentation of truth here. King Jesus, that's the point being made, one of the points being made over and over in this part of Scripture. And if we don't see those connections, we're going to miss the very most important thing that the Bible is telling us. Today we have this great controversy raging over the true definition of the gospel and the correct relationship of the law to the gospel. And uh, many of those who, in my judgment, completely misunderstand the gospel are not doing so because they don't know Bible verses, because they haven't read the Bible, because they haven't study the Bible, but they haven't seen the right connections in the Bible. They haven't found the true system of the Bible. And the true system of the Bible in its deep, deepest sense is this, there are two ways to God, by doing perfectly or by being in Christ. Because He has done perfectly all that we could never do for ourselves. And if you don't understand that basic message of the Bible, you can have memorized the whole book and have completely missed the point. You have two choices when you stand before God at the last day. You can say, Lord, I read your law and I've done it all. I don't recommend that defense. <laughs> and the other defense is, Lord, I stand before you in the righteousness of Jesus Christ who perfectly kept your law in my place and perfectly died on the cross to satisfy your wrath against my sin. And therefore, I stand in the good news of the gospel of the kingdom of heaven that your son came to make known to me. Those connections, you see, are critical. And that leads very naturally on to the fourth point, Irresistible moralism. We as readers of the Bible find it almost impossible not to turn almost any biblical text into a morality tale. And it fits in well with our American culture. Ken was talking helpfully about certain aspects of American culture. We're an individualistic people. We are... Um, a, a democratized people. We are a people of uh, great historical forgetfulness. Um, and I am resentful about that only because it tends to make me unemployable as a historian. Um, but we are also a people absolutely committed to our national myth that anyone can get ahead who pulls himself up by his own bootstraps. Right? You can do it. You can get ahead. You just have to work hard at it. And if that's true in school, and if it's true in politics, and if it's true in business, then it must be true in religion as well. And so the message heard over and over again in all sorts of ways from all sorts of pulpits and that gets deeply rooted in our being is a message about what you need to do. You need to do more. You need to work harder. You need to be better. You need to pray more. You need to study your Bible more. Particularly, you need to give more money to seminaries <laughs> in California. Look at the phenomenon of the prayer of Jabez. At, at the heart of that, in many ways, is if you'll just pray right, you'll get everything you want. It's all about you, and what message would we rather hear than that? Work hard. See, sometimes they're even pretty good messages, useful information. We ought to pray more. We ought to evangelize more. We ought to read the Bible more. We ought to do everything more. 
or at least everything good more. My wife teaches at a Christian high school. It's, it's really quite a good school. And she says, the principal discouragement that she's experienced in recent years there is going to chapel. And how many preachers come to chapel and tell the young people what they need to be doing. And my wife comes away shaking her head and saying, another Christless chapel. Don't use drugs, don't drink alcohol, don't have sex, don't do this, don't do that, do this, do that. There's a place for some of that. But it is not the whole message of the scripture. It's not even the most important message of the scripture. There, there is sometimes an evangelical temptation to think, well, you begin the Christian life at the cross, but once you've been saved, once you've been converted, then you go on to grow, apparently, mainly, by your own strength and hard work. Oh, oh yeah, the cross. Well, yeah, that's important at the beginning. No, it's important every day. Because every day we are sinners in need of grace. Every day we need a savior. Every day we need to be filled with a sense of gratitude to Jesus Christ for all that he's done for us. Every day we need to be reminded that the only motivation for Christian living that will move us forward in holiness is to live out of gratitude for what Christ has done and out of ardent love for him. We have to avoid the moralism that so easily besets us. Matthew gives the longest version of the Sermon on the Mount that we have in chapters 5 through 7, and it's terribly tempting to treat the Sermon on the Mount in a moralistic way. What's it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Well, let's make a list of all the duties we have in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, there are duties in the Sermon on the Mount. There is an ideal presented before us to, to which we need to strive. But we must never read the Sermon on the Mount or think about the Sermon on the Mount except in the context of what Matthew tells us in chapter 4. And what we read in chapter 4 is that the Jesus who stood on the Mount teaching his disciples is the Jesus who came into the world as the great light. Matthew 4, 16, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Jesus is the great light come into the world. That light shines in the way in which he fulfilled prophecy. That light shines in all of his deeds, especially as he hung upon the cross for our sins. That light shines in his word and all of his words to us. And it's only as we look to Jesus, that great light, that the Sermon on the Mount does not become a new and more burdensome law to us. But because he is the light, because he is our savior, because he has uh, shined into us to give us the light of life, we can look at that Sermon on the Mount and say, oh, Savior, let me live a life that pleases you out of gratitude for what you've done, out of my love for you because of your great love for me. Well, have you got a good suggestion for a P? The final error, I think, is a persevering unbelief. The great error always in reading the scripture, the fun foundational error is, is unbelief. You noticed, didn't you, in Matthew chapter 2 that when the Magi came to Jerusalem and asked where Messiah would be born, everybody knew. These were people who knew their Bible. I mean, how many verses can we quote out of Micah? They knew. Their problem was not an ignorance of the word. Now, I don't know whether Herod could have quoted Micah, but Herod knew enough to know that when his uh, teachers of the law told him 
that uh, Jesus was to be born in Bethlehem, that they were right. And how did Herod and everyone in Jerusalem respond? They were upset. They were disturbed. They were worried. A new king? Will I still get my pension? A new king? Will I keep my job? I knew how to flatter the old king. What am I going to have to learn to flatter the new king? They did not receive the word that they heard and that they knew on some level with faith. They persevered in unbelief, and because they were unbelieving, we have this horror story of Herod sending out to slaughter all the young children that he could find, lest this king slip through his grasp. The consequences of unbelief are tragic. And the essence of belief as we come to the scriptures is to find Jesus and his gospel there. That's what Jesus taught us, didn't he, when he was speaking to the Jewish leaders in John 5. He said, his word does not dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. You diligently study the scriptures because you think by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. There's the essence of what the scriptures are about. To teach us about the one God sent in whom there is life. And if we won't believe in the Christ, if we won't accept what God has said about him in his word, if we won't accept the scripture's definition of the gospel, we can have no hope of life. We will be those who persevere in unbelief. Psalm 95, after its wonderful call to worship, suddenly midstream changes its mood and direction apparently, and having celebrated the God whom we come to worship, then says to the people, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Through the whole history of biblical times and the history of the church, there have been those who heard the word and shut their hearts against it. Hebrews takes up that verse in a kind of extended meditation in Hebrews 3 and 4 and applies the verse to the church and says, See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Who is the living God? the God revealed in the Scripture. What do we know about the living God apart from Scripture? Nothing. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful and unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. And we need that word because that word reveals to us the character of our hearts. It reveals to us, it makes clear to us whether our hearts are hardened or not. Chapter 4, verse 12, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It judges, it judges the attitudes and thoughts of the heart. Do you need to know what's in your heart? Then you need to open the Scripture and look into it and let the Scripture do its work in pointing out to you if there is unbelief there, if there is resistance there. There are lots more errors that we could find, but we don't want to become hyper-Calvinists. So we'll, we'll content ourselves with these five, and if we can avoid these five, we'll do a pretty good job and avoid some of the most deadly sins in approaching the Bible. Guard yourself against total slothfulness, against unconditional self-confidence, against limited connections, against irresistible moralism, against persevering unbelief. 
and approach the Bible rather in the spirit of Psalm 119, verses 10 and 11. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden, my, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. May that be true of all of us. Let us pray together. Oh Lord, our God, you know how prone we are to sin and to error. You know how much we need to be humbled before your word, how much we need the wisdom of your people. And we pray, oh Lord, that you will fill us with a delight in your word, an eagerness to know it and to love it, and that by the power of your spirit, you would protect us from the many errors that can beset us and rather help us to see in all of its sweetness and its purity that scripture that leads us on to Christ and to life in him. Hear us, for it's in the name of our Savior that we pray. Amen.